You also asked me, what is the science after the bell curve? And the short answer is there's not much new work, but whatever work there is supports the idea that there still are group differences. It's arguable whether those differences have diminished at all or not. And there is still a major problem in underperformance in, in, for school achievement. For many uh, mis disadvantaged and minority students, and there so far is no way to fix it. Uh, what do we do with this information? What do, uh, is this? Is this now a task? Now we'll talk about the future uh, on the neuroscience and the biology side. But in terms of this information as a society, in the public policy, in the political space, in the social space, what do we do with this information? I've thought a lot about this. The first step is to have people interested in policy understand what the data actually show, to pay attention to intelligence data. You can read policy papers about education, and using your word processor, you can search for the word intelligence. You can search a, a 20,000 word document in a second and find out the word intelligence does not appear anywhere. In most discussions about what to do about achievement gaps, I'm not talking about test gaps, I'm talking about actual achievement gaps in schools, which everyone agrees is a problem. The word intelligence doesn't appear among educators. That's fascinating. As a matter of fact, in California, there has been tremendous controversy about recent attempts to revise the curriculum for math in high schools. And we had a Stanford professor of education who was running this review assert there's no such thing as talent, of mathematical talent. And she wanted to get rid of the advanced classes in math because, you know, not everyone could do that. Now, of course, this has been very controversial. They've retreated somewhat. But the idea that a university professor was in charge of this who believes not, not that there's no talent, <laughs> that it doesn't exist. This is rather shocking, let alone the complete absence of intelligence data. By the way, let me tell you something about what the intelligence data show. Let's take race out of it. Uh, even though the origins of these studies uh, were, were uh, a long time ago, um, uh, I'm blocking on the name of the report. The Coleman Report was a famous report about education. And they measured all kinds of variables about schools, about teachers. And they looked at uh, academic achievement as an outcome. And they found the most predictive variables of education outcome were the variables the student brought with him or her into the school, essentially their ability. And that when you combine the school and the teacher variables together, the quality of the school, the funding of the school, the quality of the teachers, their education, you put all the teacher and school variables together, it barely accounted for 10% of the variance. And this has been replicated now. You know, So the best research we have shows that school variables and teacher variables together account for about 10% of student academic achievement. Now, you want to have some policy on improving academic achievement? How much money do you want to put into teacher education? How much money do you want to put into the quality of, of, of the school administration? You know who you can ask? You can ask the Gates Foundation because they spent a tremendous amount of money doing that. And they, at the end of it, because they're measurement people, they want to you know, they, they know the data, they found it had no impact at all. And they've kind of pulled out of, of that kind of program. So, oh boy. Let me ask, let me ask you, uh, this is me talking, but there's... Just the two of us. Well, just the two of us, but I'm gonna say uh, some funny and ridiculous things. So it's you surely are not approving of it. Uh, but there's a movie called Clerks. You probably I've seen it. I've seen, seen it. it. Yeah. There's a funny scene in there 
where uh, a lovely couple are talking about the number of previous sexual partners they had. And uh, uh, the, the woman says that, I believe she just had a handful, like two or three or something like that, sexual partners, but then she also mentioned um, that she, um, what's that called? Uh, fellatio, what's the scientific, but she, she went, you know, gave a blowjob to uh, 37 guys, I believe it is. And uh, so that has to do with the truth. So sometimes knowing the truth can get in the way of a successful relationship of love of some of the human flourishing. And that's seems to me that's at the core here, that facing some kind of truth that's not able to be changed is makes it difficult to sort of is limiting as opposed to empowering. That's the concern. If you sort of test for intelligence and lay the data out, it feels like you will give up on certain people. You will you'll you'll sort of start bidding people as like, well, this is this person is like let's focus on the average people or let's focus on the very intelligent people. That's the concern. And and there's a kind of intuition that if we just don't measure and we don't use that data, that we would treat everybody equal and give everybody uh, equal opportunity. If we have the data in front of us, we're likely to miss uh, distribute the amount of sort of attention we allocate, resources we allocate, uh, allocate to people. That's that's probably the concern. It, it's uh, a realistic concern, and it, but I think it's a misplaced concern if you want to fix the problem. If you want to fix the problem, you have to know what the problem is. Yep. <laughs> now let yeah. me let me tell you this. Let's go back to the bell curve for not the bell curve, but the normal distribution. Yes, sixteen percent of the population on average has an IQ under 85, mm -hmm. which means they're very hard. If you have an IQ under 85, it's very hard to find gainful employment at a salary that sustains you at least minimally in modern life. Okay? Not impossible, but it's very difficult. 16% of the population of the United States is about 51 or 52 million people with IQs under 85. This is not a small issue. 14 million children have IQs under 85. Is this something we want to ignore? Does this have any, what is the Venn diagram between, uh, you know, when you have people with IQs under 85 and you have achievement in school? or achievement in life. There's a lot of overlap there. This is why, to go back to the IQ pill, if there were a way to shift that curve toward the higher end, that would have a big impact.